Hello, everyone. Um, I want to thank everyone for registering and attending our Learning Views webinar series that's sponsored by Training Pros and Harrisburg University Together. Um, first, I'm just going to introduce myself. Um, I recognize a lot of names out there, so some of you already know me. My name is Leanne Lankford. I'm a Training Pros Relationship Manager and have been for over seven years. I serve clients in the Southeast region, more specifically clients in the Atlanta market. Um, I have an instructional design background um, that spans across retail, finance, leadership, human resources, and healthcare back in the days when I was a consultant at, in the talent pool. Um, more about my background, I have a master's degree from Georgia State University in human resource development and over 23 years mm -hmm. experience in our field. Um, I do a lot of volunteer work with ATD for the last 11 years for the Greater Atlanta Chapter, and I currently serve as a senior advisor on the Board of Directors. Next, I want to tell you briefly about Training Pros, if you're not familiar with us. Um, we are the leading provider of contract learning and development talent in the U United States. We are highly specialized, focusing only in on learning and development consultants and projects. We have three big differences that set us apart from other companies in our market. Number one is our relationship managers like me are experienced in the field, so we really understand our consultants and our clients, what kind of projects they have and what, what is a great match for that project. Our second big differentiator is our consultants. We work with great consultants that are highly experienced and we try to work with the same consultants over and over again. And finally, our third differentiator is our onboarding for success methodology to help our consultants get up, up and running much more quickly. Um, we, our contact information is shown here, and we'd like to invite anyone to contact us to learn more about our services. And you can always visit our webpage at training-pros.com. Um, another note about Training Pros is we do provide talent in a variety of fields in the learning and development field, not just instructional design and development, but we also do a lot of work in e-learning, m-learning, um, technical writing, OD work, facilitation. We have a lot of training coordinators we put to work. We work in change management. We provide project managers, and we also have editors and copywriters. Mm -hmm. Training Pros and Harrisburg University are partnering on the Learning Views webinar series because we want to share the latest developments that Training Pros is observing with our clients, and we also want to demonstrate how Harrisburg University is able to provide a master's level program to professionals who want to or need to pursue an advanced degree in the learning technology space. Harrisburg University translates the latest developments in learning technologies into a master's program for professionals responsible for building skills and capabilities in corporate organizations. Harrisburg University provides students with leading edge approaches and skills to help them apply existing and emerging learning technologies in a variety of learning environments. So on to today's program. Um, today's program is called the First Principles of Instruction it's from Dr. David Merrill. Um, it provides a framework for designing instruction that moves beyond the rote information-based instruction that is commonplace in corporate learning and all levels of education. Our presenter today is Andy Petrosky. He's the Director and Assistant Professor of Learning Technologies at Harrisburg University of Science and Technology. Andy coordinates the Learning Technologies Master of Science program, and he teaches courses in serious game design, gamification, advanced instructional design, and online learning. Ooh, I want to take some of his classes. So please welcome Andy Petrosky. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, in addition to coordinating the teaching in the uh, coordinating and teaching in the Learning Technologies Master of Science program at Harrisburg University, 
I also work with the faculty at the university to help them integrate technology into their courses, and I do work on uh, problem-based projects with clients as well through our Center for Advanced Entertainment and Learning Technologies. And one of the courses in our Learning Technologies Master of Science program is Micro Instructional Design. And in that course, we focused on the first principles of instruction. I have one um, example from a, a course that a student created, um, uh, an e-learning course that a student created from that um, Micro Instructional Design course. So thank you again, and welcome everyone to today's session where we're going to focus on the first principles of instruction. Uh, before we get started, I want to introduce you to the space here. Um, we do have a producer for uh, today's event, but I do have a uh, reporting tech issues chat over here on the left side uh, of the presentation space. Um, the arrow only points to the right, but hopefully that'll get your attention over here under the attendees area. So if you have any tech issues and can uh, type those in there, that'll be helpful with us managing that. Uh, at the bottom below the presentation space, there's a chat area, and we hope to be pretty active in there, as well as uh, getting you active throughout the session. And so a big part of our success today is going to be you um, thinking about things that you're working on now or might be working on in the near future. And for any of you that, any of you that have experience with the first principles of instruction, um, certainly lending your insights into ways that you've um, incorporated the principles. And then there's also a Q&A area here next to the chat. The Q&A area is for uh, more detailed questions uh, that may be difficult to um, read in the chat for us. Uh, or if you want to make sure your question is captured, your more detailed question is captured, um, type that in the Q&A space versus the chat. Uh, the chat will go by quickly with uh, almost 100 folks in the, in the session today. So, I think we can all agree that instruction should be engaging, effective, and efficient. Uh, the First Principles of Instruction by Dr. David Merrill uh, provides a framework for designing instruction that moves beyond that rote information-based instruction, and, and Leanne talked about this in her introduction, that is commonplace. Certainly, I think we're seeing a changing trend in uh, instructional design, learning design, educational technologies that is moving towards a more immersive learning experience. But um, as instructional designers, certainly, um, finding principles and guidelines that will help us move um, in that direction uh, more efficiently can, can certainly be helpful, and that's what we'll talk about today. Uh, through the first principles, uh, we're focused on the fact that learning should be problem-centered, required activation, include demonstration, require application, and incorporate opportunities for integration. So today is what, what we'll be doing is exploring those first principles of, of instruction and again asking you to practice uh, applying them to one of your uh, learning designs, either upcoming or, or one that you've done uh, recently that maybe you think you might want to, uh, you know, might, might want to have done differently. So to get a sense of where you guys are with this topic, I'm going to pull a poll out onto the screen here to, uh, to uh, give you a chance to let us know where you are and what your experience is with the first principles and uh, how many of you have been you know, working in this space or with these techniques or principles previously. And I'll give you just uh, a minute here to, uh, for everyone to react to the poll. Okay, it looks like we have most folks have uh, have uh, selected their option, and we have a small percentages that are experienced. And uh, for you guys that have indicated that, I would love to, um, you know, again have you interact heavily in the chat, and also as we go out into um, exploring the first principles, um, principle by principle, certainly sharing things that you have done previously that have really worked for you. Uh, and those of you that are just getting started, um, makes sense that you know that's the majority of everyone in this session, and that's um, you know where we're where we're focused today is an introduction to the principles, uh, as well as uh, some uh, practice applying those. So I'll hide that poll, and uh, then move on to a visualization of what we've kind of hit on here with the fact that a lot of instruction and um, the the basics or the um, basic interpretation of instructional design models leads to 
learning or e-learning that is often um, designed like this, where information is the primary component of the learning solution. There may be some activities. Um, there may be a check for understanding quiz, but linear information presentation is, is really the driving force. And what we want to do today is move to um, a place where uh, there's a focus on practice and how to apply knowledge and skills and information within the context of solving problems and using information as a way of supporting decision making. So earlier I mentioned uh, quality instruction and effective, efficient, and engaging instruction. And in his book, and, and I'm not uh, involved with the book at all, we use the textbook in, in the course that we teach in the Learning Technologies Program, and I just do uh, really believe in, in uh, this instructional design uh, methodology and, and do a number of presentations on it. So um, just share that the book is really where this information comes from, and certainly um, check that book out if you want to learn more after today session. Um, so just that disclaimer. Uh, the, uh, the book um, considers um, what we need to change uh, and, and why we need to design instruction a little bit differently um, because um, we need to focus on that effective, efficient, and engaging design. Um, and that is Dr. Merrill's description of quality instruction. However, those terms themselves are not necessarily very concrete terms, and they may mean different things to each person. So what I'd like to do is just uh, take a minute to move to a different layout here where you guys can let us know what your thoughts are on effective, efficient, and engaging instruction and what that means to you. So you can type in the text chat areas here uh, that are specifically designed for effective instruction on the far left, efficient instruction in the middle, and engaging instruction on the far right and what that means to you. And we will go back to our previous interface when we're done here so the ongoing chat will, will um, be available once again at that time. And as um, comments are coming in, I'm certainly not going to have a chance to address all of them, so I would ask you to read others' comments as they come in, and I'll try to summarize them as we conclude here. Uh, as well, in the text chat, I'm most likely not going to be able to get to all of the uh, questions or comments, but we do do follow-up articles on these sessions through Training Pros, and so one of the things that we'll do is capture the text chat, and I'll address any of the uh, questions or comments that we can't address directly today. I'll, I'll address those in those articles. So effective instruction is measurable. It um, applies um, on the job. It sticks, so there's some transfer. Um, the learner is actively engaged, reasonable costs. So um, um, while I don't like to focus on costs as a primary determining factor on instructional strategies, uh, I will highlight that as something that um, is a consideration when thinking about problem-based instruction, uh, especially when people hear the term simulation, they think high cost. And that doesn't necessarily need to be the case, I'll emphasize that, but at the same time, um, that cost factor and doing more low fidelity um, problem-based interactions and problem-based training um, really does hit the mark on effective instruction and maybe even more into the area of efficient in that you're getting the most out of the dollars that you're putting into it even though it doesn't have you know 3D graphics and, and, and all of those things. And then there's uh, a focus here on simplification, addressing objectives and all of that. Um, and and uh, those are those are great examples of effective instruction. Um, efficient, uh, understanding baseline, baseline, baseline knowledge right away, Mike. Yeah, so you know, hitting the learners or meeting the learners where they are and where they need to be. So not providing you know too much background information if it's really not needed, and certainly um, not you know basing um, your training on on uh, some of that rote and and introductory information. Um, that isn't necessarily performance-based or, um, or decision-based. Efficient, uh, certainly the logistics of efficiency, easy to access and locate, appropriate media, it's kind of just hitting on that with the um, concept of low fidelity simulations. Okay, so great. Thank you guys. And engaging. This is one so effective and efficient, although those terms in themselves are not concrete, usually there's a lot of agreement on what those terms mean in an instructional setting and when we're talking about um, education and training. However, engaging certainly um, 
there, I think, is a little bit more, uh, there's a bigger gap in people's um, common um, perception or common definition of what engaging is. And so uh, you can see a number of those there. Interactive, um, when we think about interactive, that's a, a trap sometimes for instructional designers and developers uh, in that is interactive clicking the mouse or is interactive mental engagement and cognitive engagement? And I would argue for the latter, and that'll be an emphasis of what we talk about today. Uh, so drag and drops are ne not necessarily the type of interaction that we're looking for depending on you know what the goal of those are and the context of those. Uh, storytelling certainly it can be engaging and doesn't really involve any type of technology or or mouse clicking necessary, necessarily. So learner engagement is certainly um, important and Julie I think you've uh, emphasized a, an addition to that that learners will recall and take away and be able to apply. So just engaging them um, can sometimes be entertaining them, but that entertainment in an instructional setting really doesn't have impact or isn't warranted unless there's some learning or performance outcome as a result of that. So thank you guys for participating there, and that's the type of thing we'll you know, be looking for um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the day. So. Now that we've kind of identified our focus of what quality instruction is and uh, efficient, effective, and engaging instru instruction, I uh, want to take a look at the first principles. So let's, let's dive in. Um, the first principles of instruction focus on the fact that learning is promoted when learners are engaged in real world problem solving. So solving real world, prob real world problems. Learning is also promoted when a mental model of existing knowledge is activated as a, as a foundation of new skills. And so um, activation, uh, certainly something that as instructional designers, a lot of us are familiar with. But we'll take a look at some, uh, some different ways maybe of thinking about that today. Learning is promoted when new knowledge is demonstrated to the learner in a way that is consistent with the type of content being taught. Learning is promoted when new knowledge is applied by the learner, consistent with the type of content that's being taught, and the desired learning outcomes. And learning is promoted when new knowledge is integrated into the learner's world through reflection, discussion, or defense of newly acquired knowledge and skill. So as Ken points out, um, the terminology that's being used here are fairly um, basic adult learning principles and um, especially activation, demonstration, and application. I will, again, maybe show some ways that we can think about those differently in a problem-based environment, which I think problem-based you know, based learning isn't necessarily a new term, but thinking about it, um, thinking about problems as the center of learning solutions, I think, is something new to instructional designers, uh, even experienced ones, at least in my experience. Um, and the folks that, that I've worked with throughout the years. And certainly, I think integration is, is a fairly new concept. Now, that transfer of training concept is not new and certainly something that has been a big emphasis, at least in recent years. But incorporating that integration into the learning solution and as part of the learning experience for the learners may be something, as instructional designers, we don't do on a regular basis. So problem and integration will be uh, two things that we maybe focus on a little bit more uh, today. So let's start with problem. Again, learning is promoted when learners are engaged in solving real world problems. As part of that, we need to make sure that the problems are authentic. So I think we um, probably have all design, and I know I have, or have seen problem-based learning that is um, maybe just on the edge of too kitschy or maybe completely disconnected from um, the learning environment or the skills that are, um, you know, that need to be applied. So creating a problem is, sounds easy, um, that learners can solve sounds easy, but there are certainly some intricacies to that. So the problems need to be authentic, useful, meaningful, and, in and intrinsically motivating to the student. Uh, as part of that as well, the challenges should be easy at first, but then be increasingly difficult as you move through the materials, making sure that problems and tasks safely allow the practice of skills and sub-skills. So there, again, there are some intricacies to thinking about problems and in, um, in 
um, Merrill's book, it's referred to as problem progression and thinking about problems as a series of experiences that um, you're applying various sub-skills in and are also um, increasingly difficult as you continue to develop your skills. Uh, so let's have you think about your um, instructional goal for today. And again, this can be um, a learning solution that you just recently designed and maybe would have liked to have done a little differently or you just got assigned something yesterday or today and you want to think about it a little bit differently. So the first thing I'd like you to do is type your instructional goal and this goal will follow you throughout the um, session today. So take some time, you know, take a, we can't take a lot of time, but take a little bit of time to uh, think about an instructional goal. And then I've emphasized or, or um, shared the definition or the more detailed definition of what a problem is in the first principles of instruction. Um, in the in the notes area here to the top right and then below that what I'd like you to do is type a problem or a challenge for the learner to solve as part of your instructional goal. So for the instructional goal, I want you to think about a training solution that you're building, not necessarily what your instructional goal is for today. So what we want to do is apply the problem and challenges that the learner is going to solve um, to something that you're creating training for. Um, so uh, Christine, um, what is the classroom course that you're creating to self, uh, that you're changing to self-directed online training. So what's the topic of that or what's the, what are the learning objectives or the learning goal of that? And Darlene, um, you've indicated to organize meetings more effectively. That's a great instructional um, goal for our purpose today. Something that's also kind of finite and focused would also be good um, as part of what we're doing. So not just um, changing formats or um, what you want to get out of today, but a specific training um, goal that you have for one of the programs that you're designing um, or that you'll be training on as a trainer or an instructional designer. And can your um, goal is your kind of generic goal there is great as well. So to acquire the skills to perform whatever role in compliance with corporate policies and procedures. So that will work um, for today as well. And so uh, yeah, continue typing those in. Um, certainly uh, in this environment, it's also okay to lurk and you know maybe um, pick someone else's goal if you can't think of of one yourself that you can use throughout, um, which is which is perfectly fine. Uh, and then as we move to thinking about the problem or challenge for the learners to solve, uh, it sounds easy creating a problem. Um, so, but when you actually go to do it, um, it certainly is a little bit more challenging, especially within the context of the first principles of instruction and creating that opportunity for um, especially application and integration for learners. And the students that I work with, um, the graduate students, this is one of the things they, they often struggle with and that makes it challenging for them in the course, is that, um, that coming up with the problem. So um, uh, one of the comments here, and, I, and I'll just pull one of them out, learner needs to understand, embrace, and use new individual development planning process. So that is a... Um, uh, a learning objective, embrace and use, uh, but it's not necessarily a problem. So what problem is going to be presented to the learner? Perhaps um, the problem is that their um, boss has asked them to um, complete their individual development planning process before their meeting tomorrow. And so there's some urgency to that problem and there's some things that the, you know, that the person needs to do and, and, and they um, are engaged in solving that problem as part of um, their experience. And that's one of the challenges with, uh, you know, instructional design um, 
methodologies and how we learn them as instructional designers is the methodologies themselves are often transferred right into the learning solution. So that example is a good example in that, again, those are great learning objectives, embrace and use, but to a learner, um, you know, and in a problem-based setting, those those terms are, are ID terms. They're for us. They're not necessarily for the learner. As the learner, I'm much more engaged and apt to be able to apply and understand demonstration and see the value um, if I am presented with this problem that I have to do this tomorrow. And OK, what do I need to do? And how do I solve this problem? So and I'm seeing a lot of that here, learning objectives and not necessarily problems. And, and uh, Angelique, um, your example there, a small business customer comes to a retail store, the salesperson needs to be able to handle the end-to-end -end sale. That's a, a really good example of a problem. And as if we were designing this, that problem would probably be even much more specific. Um, the salesperson needs to handle the end-to-end -end sale when a customer comes in and asks for this or something like that. All right. So I uh, have a few uh, folks typing still, so we'll just uh, give them a moment here, but we will need to, to move on. And if you don't get a chance to type it in the text chat, certainly just note your instructional goal and your problem so that you can come back to that and use that again a little bit later. So this is an example of what a um, problem-based experience might look like. Um, this is from conduct uh, Conducting Effective Negotiations, Harvard Business Pub Publishing. Um, the focus of this and some of the problems that were presented as part of this is to conduct um, effective negotiations, to avoid traps, and seek opportunities. So again, like Angelique's example, very focused on you know meet with this customer and conduct a negotiation and do so effectively by avoiding traps and seeking opportunities. Here's another one, and I forget now the name of the person who was focused on meeting and efficient meetings, but um, this example fits right into, or this uh, um, screen capture fits right into that uh, topic, um, where the problem is certainly um, avoiding meeting missteps and creating um, effective meetings, but even more focused than that, preparing for a meeting, facilitate a meeting, optimize the meeting. Again, those are learning objectives, but those are things that would be presented as part of preparing or creating a, um, a focus meeting. So the problem is creating a focus meeting. One of the sub-problems may be preparing for the meeting. Again, sub-problem facilitating and optimizing. So now let's talk about activation. And certainly um, continue to type in the text chat or type in the Q&A any questions that you have about problems and um, creating that problem as part of the first principles of instruction. And we'll um, come back to those throughout the session. And again, if I'm not able to get to them, we'll follow up, on the, um, we'll follow up in the articles that uh, follow this. So activation is when learning is promoted, when a mental model of existing knowledge is activated as a foundation of new skills and is the basis for um, um, demonstration, application, and integration. So it's not necessarily just a beginning task as well. It supports all the other tasks. And one of the things I'll emphasize as well as the first principles is we kind of go around um, clockwise from activation to integration, uh, is that these are not not necessarily linear steps that you put in place. These are all things to consider as part of um, an instructional solution. And depending on your audience, depending on the goals of your instruction, depending on the topic, um, you may jump around to, to a number of these um, throughout your um, training solution. Or you may be, you know, stage uh, problem one is includes activation, demonstration, application, integration, problem two, it includes the same and so on. So it's not activation at the beginning, integration at the end necessarily. So, and again, I think that's a challenge with a lot of instructional design models as we look at them as very linear types of, of things. Um, so activation allows learners to look ahead and preview what they will learn. Uh, it allows them to let them see the problems to be solved and the subjects they will learn. 
It also allows them to show the process they will, or allows them to see the process they'll go through to solve problems. And it att activation should attempt to make the structure of the information and knowledge obvious by using a model to organize instructional materials. Um, so activation is much more than simple recall uh, and is focused on creating some um, depth of um, anticipation as part of activation. So here is uh, an intro screen to an e-learning program. And I'm going to pull another poll out onto the screen here. And I want you guys to give me a sense of, and I'll just kind of move it off to the side here so we can see that or most of it. And I want you guys to give me a sense of whether this is a good example of activation. Okay, and we have um, a good number of folks who have um, participated here. So, you know, still a small percentage of the of the 92, but I've got a sense the, of where we're going here with the percentages. So, uh, appreciate you guys um, interacting and contributing, and and um, love to see um, as many as possible get uh, get uh, involved with some of the feedback here um, as part of us exploring these together. Uh, so. Um, number of folks indicating this is a good example of activation, the majority. Um, also, um, um, in second there, I, I guess I should say, is maybe. Um, I would probably say the answer to this is maybe, because we really don't know the context of this. So to just pull one screen out of an e-learning um, solution and, and evaluate it is not really fair. Um, so I would say the answer is probably maybe. But for the purpose of my, excuse me, I'm going to going to have to reduce that, thanks. Um, in, for the purpose of um, our example here today, I'm going to say that no, this is not a good example of activation. It's not promoting a metal model of existing knowledge, a foundation of new skills. It's not really setting a basis for demonstration. It's not really giving the learners a, a true look ahead. So listing learning objectives is probably the most common way in which instructional designers and we establish activation, but the first principles of, instruct, uh, of instruction certainly um, indicate and encourage us to move um, well beyond that. So this may, this may be a better example of activation, and again, pulling it out of, out of, uh, out of context. And I think Nancy mentioned as well that the um, slides that I showed originally um, for an example of a problem didn't necessarily have a problem stated on the screen. And so um, that, that is true. Um, but again, within the instructional um, piece itself, I, I wanted to, you, you would probably present the problem, you would, in most cases, you would present the problem to the learner. Um, in the case of showing an example, I wanted to show what solving that problem might look like. So um, some of these are, again, taken out of context, and um, I'm giving maybe just brief examples um, um, uh, of some of these concepts. And certainly some further expo exploration is warranted, and I'll give you some resources that will allow you to do that as part of um, follow-up to this session. So. Um, here, we're focused on um, activating that prior experience by, by maybe presenting um, something that we're familiar with, either as an interviewer or as someone who's being interviewed and being nervous or being confident, and also that um, experience we have of kind of you know going to that person who's really personable and good rapport and you know maybe is really um, quite outgoing in an interview scenario and kind of Certainly, that's an important piece, but but kind of being overwhelmed or overtaken or overfocused on that part of it versus credentials and the tasks and the skills that they'll be able to do. Um, it also focuses on introducing what the experience is going to be throughout the course. So you're going to be asked to make decisions like this. And um, it, it is kind of beginning to prepare for the demonstration of what is a good candidate or how should you think about leadership skills in a um, interview beyond uh, you know, the things that might be very apparent. 
This is also another um, example of activation. Uh, this one has a, a what's in it for me. So there are no objectives listed here. But certainly, um, if I have type 2 diabetes or have someone that I know who has type 2 diabetes, this would activate my um, attention and activate my prior knowledge and readiness for uh, learning as well as you know demonstrations and application. Uh, these are the objectives. Um, what we're focusing on here are objectives in non-ID speak. Again, a lot of our terminology and things that we use um, must uh, must uh, you know often kind of translate from the instructional design process right into the learning solution, where learners really are um, speaking a different language, or we should be speaking a different language to them than we do um, as we prepare and as we speak among ourselves and with our SMEs. And it's establishing a, a structural framework from the standpoint of there's some emotion established here in these intro slides, and I'm only pulling, again, one of them out for you. So let's go back to our instructional goal and our problem. So you'll have to recall your problem in this case. The instructional goal should reload here. And it may not, so you may have to recall that. Um, and then the definition of activation is listed above. So Again, here come, your, here come your instructional goals. There's a lot in there, I guess. Thank you guys for participating. Uh, so with your instructional goal and the problem, and maybe your revised problem after we um, investigated problem a little bit more, how would you create activation for your learning solution that you're creating based on the definition above and the examples that we that we.
Sorry, guys. Thanks for that. I did mute while you were um, while we were uh, in demonstration there, or I'm sorry, activation. And I apologize for that, but thank you guys for participating. Um, and I did want to call out Rick's um, um, activation about asking learners to recall prior camping and canoe trips and discussing problems um, they had with packing. Uh, that's a good example of activation and maybe even a, a little bit of an example of what that might look like um, would, be, would be a good idea. And the potential consequences, uh, in, because they, they might, the person or the you know, the learner may not have experienced the con the ultimate consequences of maybe what that could cause. So as we come back here uh, and think about demonstration, I want to uh, reiterate uh, that learning is promoted in demonstration when new knowledge is demonstrated to the learner in a way that is consistent with the type of content being taught and it is enhanced when guidance is provided. And a variety of examples of the topic and related cases and information sources is also um, a, a way of enhancing demonstration. So some of the things, again, um, with uh, that I mentioned with activation, you know, begin to bleed a little bit into demonstration. So again, these are not linear processes. These are all concepts and principles to think about holistically. This is an example of a um, a good example of demonstration in my mind, this is from Tips on Tap, which is a training program um, that um, Anheuser-Busch put together for their park employees who were working in um, bars and you know um, restaurants in, in the park. And um, it's a focus on pouring a beer. And this is a demonstration of how to pour a beer and why that is important. So one of the things that um, from the standpoint of customer service and quality. Um, one of the things that um, you don't see on screen here that's that's a part of this is um, there's the intro here at the very top uh, that indicates before we open the bar, I'll show you the basics of serving a beer. Um, and then after we're open, you'll serve some customers. So from this screen, um, you can go to a demonstration that kind of walks you through how to serve a beer. Um, and it's not, it's kind of, it's very guided and um, is uh, step by step and is not necessarily application where you're trying to solve the, the problem. Uh, the one below that is an example of a video that you can play when you come back in after that guided demonstration that shows a video based example of the steps and how it looks like. And it's also a good example of um, you know application to the real world in this much more you know cartoon uh, like environment. So uh, here a focus on demonstrating that new knowledge including guidance with that and providing a, a variety of examples. So there's not only the guided um, uh, demonstration but there's the video as well. And here's another example of demonstration. Uh, in this case uh, certainly we're demonstrating the process as part of um, an introduction and including some guidance, as well as um, in the candidate assessment field, um, providing an example. And it, it's not included in this learning solution, but um, walking them through that example would be another um, good way of uh, applying demonstration. So let's um, skip chatting about demonstration and think a little bit about, so we'll go to application and integration, um, those chat layouts, but think a little bit about how you might use demonstration after activation as part of your learning solution. And then we'll, uh, we'll continue on. So we won't go to the chat layout here. I'm just going to ask you to, um, uh, just going to ask you to uh, think about that a little bit. So when we think about application, um, we should have a focus on the fact that learning is promoted when new knowledge is applied by the learner, consistent with the type of content being taught, and when intrinsic or corrective feedback is provided. So that's um, a little bit of differentiation between demonstration and application, is that demonstration um, is the learner watching and observing and maybe thinking or reflecting, but not necessarily um, making decisions. Uh, and, and so in application, um, the learner is making decisions and feedback is an important component of that. And that application is enhanced when learners are coached and when the coaching is gradually withdrawn. So 
again, some of this, some of these approaches are maybe familiar with you, but a, a real important distinction with application beyond learners just answering questions to solve problems is that concept of guided practice, thanks Nancy, um, and coaching and gradually withdrawing that coaching. And I think um, oftentimes that gradual withdrawal of coaching is maybe something that we don't focus on or is not a part of, uh, of our instructional uh, design. So think about we're going to go to the, to the application text uh, layout now where you can, you can think about how your learners are actually going to apply and practice skills that were demonstrated. So you can maybe think about both of those things at the same time in the next layout. But let's go and focus on application. And I will just leave my mic on this time so we don't have the, uh, the muting issue that we had before. Apologize for that again. And as you think about application, think about um, especially the type of feedback that you might give and any ways in which you might incorporate coaching. Those are, are important components of that application piece. Uh, feedback, I think, certainly something that as instructional designers is a, is a core of what we do and, and how we design solutions. But again, that coaching element um, may be not necessarily something that we regularly focus on. So we have a number of folks who are typing. Now just wait for some of those to come in. So Alicia, definitely um, allowing the learner to practice and actually, you know, make decisions within the learning solution. In your case, you know, communicating with the customer is what we're really focused on and is the core of that problem uh, focused approach and the first principles of instruction. You know, oftentimes, you know, we may do activation again, although it's in often forms of just listing learning objectives beyond um, activation that's a, a preparation for learning um, and, um, you know, creates connections to previous experiences. Um, and we may demonstrate um, those two things kind of fit into um, the way they're normally executed, often fit into that presenting information. And again, what we often don't get to as a result of time or, um, uh, or money is the people actually practicing in the learning solution. So this application piece is a big um, component of what we're you know, talking about. And the problem in the middle of first principles of instruction certainly um, you know, definitely connected to this to, to the application of um, skills and knowledge and uh, should be a core and a primary component of, of what instructional design and instructional solutions should be. And some of the uh, notes in here that you have are, are a little out of context for me because I'm not able to follow along individually with each of your um, problems or your um, um, you know, problems or your um, activations or demonstrations, but um, I'll try to note some here that, that are um, clear to me. So Julie, um, having trainees submit knowledge checks um, certainly is an application of knowing how to do a knowledge check. It's not necessarily an application of the skills. So if we're just um, presenting knowledge to the learner, oftentimes, and I'm not saying this is always the case, oftentimes that knowledge is something that can be looked up. If we want training to focus on people doing something with that knowledge, we need to, them to be able to practice that in the learning solution. So you know, multiple choice quizzes um, themselves aren't necessarily application. Certainly. Um, within the context of our development environments, what we're doing may still be a multiple choice quiz, but it has a lot more context and a lot more problem solving in it versus identifying rote information. 
And again, as instructional designers, that's that's kind of where we're coming from. And, and first principles of instruction is um, from that standard knowledge check and where we're looking to go. And the reason for attending a session like this is to um, you know, go, go a little bit beyond that into something that's much more applied. So thank you guys for sharing your ideas there. Uh, this is found out, this diagram is found out on the First Principles of Instruction wiki and is um, a useful diagram in kind of indicating that, that coaching and that problem-based approach from, and, and the fact that application um, is a part of that problem-based approach. And so we're applying um, skills as problems become more difficult uh, and then that guidance is being taken away as we're applying those skills. Uh, so this diagram represents what I'm talking about with activation. And here's an example, and this one didn't come through quite as well, but this is a legal issues training um, that is focused on the application of legal issues, which um, is, uh, you know, for new managers, which is a, a challenging um, subject uh, for new managers, but the fact that the legal department also doesn't want you to say anything. Um, so you have to have some response to employees, um, and ultimately your, your response is to have them work with HR, but to direct them appropriately, um, you need to learn a little bit about what their challenges are and, and certainly, um, you know, direct them um, for when they are talking with the HR department. So this is an example of that guidance through resources on the side. And uh, feedback is a part of um, this solution after the learner um, makes a, a selection. So coaching and guidance through the resources, uh, the learner is applying knowledge consistent with the content and within the context of their um, environment. So this is an example of, uh, of application. And now let's focus on integration, finally, where learning is promoted when new knowledge is integrated into the learner's world through reflection, discussion, or defense of newly acquired knowledge and skills. And again, something that I, I think um, is, is definitely a new concept for instructional designers and learning solutions in that you don't see a lot of integration beyond um, information in the learning solutions. So let's take a look at what that... Um, that might look like. And these two screens are an example of a student project in the micro instructional design course that we teach here at Harrisburg University. And um, is these two screens are a focus on the learner um, reflecting and thinking about how they might do things differently from what they saw in the training program and how they're going to um, continue to work on their skills after they um, have a, um, you know, after they've completed the training. So there's some reflection and there's some connection to the to the workplace. So I'd like to give you guys some chance a chance to practice on integration. So within your instructional goal and your problem, and building off of the activation demonstration and application that you've built for your project and your learning solution, how would you incorporate integration into the solution? And again, I've included the definition of integration. And if you can type your integration example below that, that would be great. And we have a number of folks who are typing in the text chat. We'll just wait for those to come in. Yeah, social learning is, is definitely a way to incorporate um, that, that integration. Uh, certainly, it can be something that's part of the learning solution and then extends it beyond it. And, and that's a good way to bridge that gap as well between uh, the learning, you know, the singular learning solution or maybe the learning solution. It could even span weeks, but it's still not an ongoing part of the workplace or the, the transfer to the work. So social learning can have an impact on that. 
And that's often where people start with social learning initiatives is, is blended learning and expanding um, those, those learning events. And Ken, um, what you've written there about post-training, coaching, reviewing with the line manager, those, I mean, that's core to the transfer of training. Um, what we're talking about here is actually incorporating some of that integration and transfer of training into the learning solution so that people don't just take it as kind of a, okay, I'm done now, I'm on the last screen, Yahoo, where's my certificate? But, okay, before we finish, let's think a little bit about, you know, what you would do differently. How are you going to work on this now? What are some goals that you have after, you know, taking this training? So um, that post-training coaching review with the line manager is certainly an important part of training transfer. Um, but there are also other ways to incorporate that integration right into the learning solution. And I'm gonna I'm gonna fight back on that test for knowledge as a way of integration, um, or and and um, emphasize and encourage us to think beyond that and get people thinking beyond um, answering, um, you know, simple. Um, I'll call them simple compared to scenario based or problem based, but simple, um, you know, information knowledge checks and really beginning to thinking about application and how am I going to apply this and where are my challenges going to be? What's one? What's my goal for the next week based on this training solution? Those are the types of integration activities that we're talking about and the first principles of instruction uh, emphasizes. So thank you guys. I'm going to have to move back to our main presentation space here. And uh, we'll conclude for today. Thank you so much for your, um, for your participation. Uh, I'll put a poll out on the screen here. I also have some resources that kind of will maybe help you think about some integration uh, after today's session. And uh, have a, some resources I want to share with you. And we'd also like to get some of your feedback before you head out today. Um, so as um, advertised and emphasized at the beginning, we talked about moving uh, beyond rote information-based instruction and focusing on a problem-centered uh, instructional solution that requires activation, demonstration, application, and integration. As I mentioned, um, you know, those um, terms in and of themselves aren't necessarily new terms, but the first principles of instruction, I think, um, includes nuances within those terms that really um, can help us create more impactful, more efficient, more engaging, and um, you know, better instruction. Effective was the last E. <laughs> Knew I'd forget that without writing it down. So effective, engaging, um, and efficient instruction. So certainly I can take any final questions in the text chat um, and would love your final comments. Um, before I do that, I'm going to move us to another layout and I can begin to um, address some of those items in this new layout. And just want to page through some of the slides and then we'll go to our feedback um, screen and would love to get your feedback. I will note that there are resources over here on the left under the attendee area and you can click on those resources. Um, attend, a participant should click on those resources and you can browse to them and then bookmark them. Uh, we'll also share those resources. as you know, Those will be part of the recording uh, and certainly we'll include those in the follow-up articles as well. So just want to share some more information um, and remind you about training pros. And thanks, Leanne, for her help and assistance today. Also share some information about Harrisburg University and all of our programs here, as well as our Learning Technologies Master of Science program and um, our locations in Harrisburg, Lancaster, Philadelphia, and online. So I know we have a lot of folks joining from throughout the U.S. today. Definitely check out um, the LTMS program. Uh, can be attended from anywhere. Once again, I will address the chat questions. I didn't have an opportunity to do that as much in the session today, but we'll do that through the follow-up articles. Uh, also want to note our um, concentrations that are available in the LTMS program, including a concentration in serious games and simulations and an instructional design concentration, which is highly focused on uh, what we talked about today. And we also have professional education webinars and workshops. And here are a few of those that are coming up. We'll have one on converting existing courses into immersive learning. 
designing a social learning strategy. And then we have our next Learning Views webinar coming up with Training Pros on March 30th. So I want to thank you guys once again. I'll go to our um, feedback layouts. The resources have now moved to the bottom, to the right of the chat. If you are in the middle of investigating those, you can do those in the same way. Um, you do not need to submit your poll or your uh, feedback entries. You just click on an option and it is registered. We're not broadcasting the results for uh, the feedback polls. And I'll take one final opportunity to thank everyone for their participation today and um, engaging in the session. Really appreciate it. And uh, I will note one final note that there is a feedback um, area, the final one on the far bottom right there. What other topics are you interested in learning about? We'd love to hear about other topics that you want to uh, learn about. And uh, that will help us and help inform some of the other LearningView sessions that we do. So thanks, everyone. Have a great, uh, great rest of your day.